Thanks, Malcolm. I'll have the last word today, fortunately. <laughs> Come here. Just a minute. Just say hi to the person next to you. I'll just be a minute here. Cleaning up. Yep. Thanks for your patience. We're going to Mark chapter 14 this morning. So Malcolm said, my name's Andrew. I've been here for a while, been on the teaching team the, the, and, and all the various different teams. And I've been studying my Bible since I was a little fella. Read it through when I was about eight, I think. Well, I claim I did. I can't, can't believe that I could read the Bible through when I was eight. But maybe I skipped a few names and bits and pieces along the way. Uh, at least I told my parents I'd read it through when I was eight. I uh, read so much stuff, and I've read this passage, Mark chapter 14, so many times. I'd encourage you to, to quickly grab a Bible out of a chair or off the front table if you're next door. There is Bibles on the back shelf if you're next door and want to come back and grab them. Uh, grab your cell phone out, Mark chapter 14. This passage I've been wrestling with for two, three weeks, and it's done my head in. And just at the end of this week, I'm starting to see stuff that, wow, I've never seen before. I'm sure that most of you would have. But it takes me a long time and a lot of Bible study to get things understood and, and worked out. But the first thing in Mark chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says to his disciples, there is a trap. Could you imagine a road sign? Well, we have road signs all the time saying there's a trap. Danger, slow down, danger, windy roads. But then he says, there's a trap and you'll all fall away. Literally, it means you'll all fall into a trap. You'll all fall away, you'll all disappear, you'll go off the cliff, you'll fall into the hole. Jesus is not only pointing out that there's danger ahead, but actually that they're going to fail. I find that phenomenal. I find that absolutely phenomenal. And then they did. They totally failed. He didn't just say one of them would fail. He said, you'll all fall away. You'll all fall away. So how will they respond to his claim that they'll all fall away? Um, they get in, I don't know if you've read it before, I don't know if you've heard anything about it before. I used to think that they responded quite poorly, but I've changed my mind on that recently to think actually they uh, responded admirably. Peter said... I'm never going to fall away from you. Even if all fall away, including the men next to him, I will not. That's admirable. That's what we do in our walk with God all the time. I'm not going to fail this time. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to trip up. Jesus said, yes, you are. Verse 30, Jesus said, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows thrice, three times, you will disown me three times. There's a whole lot of repetitions of three. There's some beautiful pictures um, all the way through the Gospels about three times in this whole fall and, and restoration business. But Jesus says, you are going to fall away. Jesus, in the first place, he knew that they were going to fall away because he had read his Bible. You see in verse 27, he's quoting from Zechariah 13.7, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus knew that when he was struck, all his followers will fall away. But then he knew something specific that had been revealed to him. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes tonight, before the rooster crows three times, you will disown me three times. God has revealed something to Jesus, or the Father has revealed something to Jesus. Got to get my terminology right. And it was specific, and it was exact, and it was completely measurable. Just keep that in mind. But then Peter, how does he respond? Peter ups his level of com commitment, and he, he almost gives three different ways of saying, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand. Peter insisted emphatically. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Not just Peter, but all the others did the same. And later he proves that he's willing to die with Jesus. He pulls out a sword and starts fighting the people that have come to get him, to kill them. 
He is so strong. So how did, did Peter and Co. go? Let's quickly read that. Uh, it's not our focus this morning, but I just want to read how they went. Uh, verse 46, let's go down to there. So men came to arrest Jesus later on, and they seized him. They seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. That seems to be Peter. And Jesus said, Am I leading a rebellion, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled, including a young man who fled naked after they grabbed his clothes, or his underclothes. Uh, and, and then some of us may have read the last bit in verse 66. Jesus gets taken in um, to be interrogated and Peter follows from a distance. And he's in the courtyard where the people are gathered. And Peter was below the courtyard, sorry, and one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but Peter denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and he went away out into the entryway. So he actually moved away from her. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow was one of them. Again, he denied it. And after a little while, those standing near to Peter said, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And then he began to call down curses and swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately a rooster crowed the second time. And then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows thrice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. I just want to put the record straight a bit. We, I've, I've heard a lot of people mock the disciples. Oh, they, they were useless there. Peter was useless. He was no good. Peter was the best trained disciple of Jesus in human history. He had spent three years closely following Jesus. He wasn't a weakling. He was a bold, brave person. He had incredible faith in Jesus. Jesus wanted him to have more faith, but he was the one that jumped out of the boat and started walking on water towards Jesus. He was the one that wasn't afraid to put it out there and ask Jesus questions. Peter was an incredible believer in Jesus. And along with Peter, these other men are the best trained disciples in human history. And in a few days' time, just a few short days' time after this event, they are going to take Christianity from um, about a hundred or less people to thousands. Okay, the Holy Spirit is going to be involved as well. But they're incredible. They had to put huge effort into the early church. Jesus trusted them to build the church. Here's some other things I want to put straight. They knew a trap was coming. Jesus had laid it out very clear, clearly for them. Look out, there is a trap coming. And I'm going to make you pay so much attention, I'm telling you, you're going to fall. They were committed to avoiding it. Peter says, I know this is coming, I'm going to avoid it, I'm going to avoid it. And then finally, they were all united as a group to say, we are going to stand. We are going to stand this test. Have you ever done something wrong? Repeatedly? And said to yourself, I'm not doing that again. And being absolutely firm in your mind, I'm never doing that again. I'm not going to behave that way. I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going to act that way. And then it happens again. Well, it happened to the disciples. And if it happened to them, you might want to say, and here where I was a couple of weeks ago, what hope is there for me? If they're falling, what chance do you and I have of overcoming sin? I remember just distinctly the conversation with, a, with an older guy in this church. He was one of the elders at the time. Dear, dear man. And he told me about one night in his house when he woke up in the middle of the night and was struggling with some issues. He didn't tell me what the issues were, but he just cried out to God in his frustration. Oh God, I just want to be holy. This guy is the holiest guy I know. He was in his 80s. 
incredible, incredible man, but he was struggling with that, that problem of how on earth do I be holy? If the closest followers of Jesus can't be holy, then how can I? Well, the interesting thing in verse 32, Jesus shows them how to be holy. He showed them how to take a stand in, in the face of intense opposition. Jesus showed them how to escape the trap. You might be interested, like I am, is to go, what did Jesus show them? What did he demonstrate? What did these disciples have opportunity to, to learn? Well, I've got three pictures that I can see in here. I've always got three pictures, if you know me. But there's three distinct things that I take away from this. That the last one is the key. But let me just point out the first one. I think it's really subtle but important. Jesus realized his vulnerability. Jesus realized his vulnerability. When Jesus said to the disciples, you'll all fall away, they said, no, no, we won't. Jesus in this moment in Gethsemane, I'm going to read it so you know what we're talking about, realizes that there is an issue and he needs to do something to be able to stand, to not fall in the trap himself. He's under intense pressure to fail. So let me read verse 32 of Mark chapter 14. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter and James and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it is uh, that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. <clears throat> Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You ever had fallen asleep and then got woken up a little bit earlier than you wanted to? I'm just checking if there's anyone in this room that's doing it at the moment. And you wake up in that daze and it's Jesus standing over you saying, just, just wake and pray. Just wake and pray. They're missing something here. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say. He appears to have gone off another time because it says, verse 41, returning the third time he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of the sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. We're looking at this passage because we're heading up to Easter. And so we've skipped a whole lot as we're going through the book of Mark. We'll pick it up later. But we've come and we've picked it up right here to see that this is just before Jesus' crucifixion and then resurrection. Jesus spent his last three hours of freedom seeking the Father's help. This was his three last hours on earth before his death, and he was seeking his Father's help. Jesus knew that he was vulnerable. He knew that he needed it. Why is the picture on the screen? Have you ever heard, ever heard of a little storybook called The Little Engine That Could? And what's the key saying? I had to Google it a little bit. Um, it's a tale about a train that must be pulled over a high mountain after its engine breaks down. And so they go to all these large engines and say, hey, can you pull this train up over the mountain? And they all had various excuses about why they couldn't. And so they went to this teeny little train and they said to this little train, could you pull the train over the mountain? And he says, oh, I don't know. I'll give it a try. And so the key words of the, the thing after they hooked him up is he starts pulling on the engine, uh, pulling on the train, and he says these words. I think I can, I think I can. That's the difference between the disciples and Jesus. The disciples were saying, I think I can, I think I can. And Jesus is saying, without going to the Father, I cannot. I cannot. Jesus is about to prove that you need more than just determination to avoid sin and failure and traps. You need to realize that actually it takes more than what you have. Look at those words, deeply distressed, 
troubled, overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I used to think this is because Jesus is worried about what is coming. But it's actually in this moment he is deeply distressed and troubled. What is he worried about? Is he worried about what's coming on the cross or is he worried about the decision that he's facing at the moment? It appears that he's totally wrestling with something. Is he going to run and sneak off again? He's struggling with the decision to go to the cross. He's praying that if it's possible, get him out of this, that this hour might pass from him. But he's saying, Father, not what I want, but what you want. Jesus was totally tempted. In Hebrews chapter 14, verse 14 to 15, it, it reflects on Jesus in this way. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. I could be wrong, but I do believe that Jesus wanted to hit the escape pod. I think he wanted to get out of it. It seems clear he's even asking the Father, if, it's, if there's any way possible, get him out of it. Maybe that's why he took the disciples to keep watch. Have you ever wondered what they're supposed to watch over? He usually went off to pray by himself. But this time, in this moment, he took the disciples. Was it to watch over Jesus so he didn't escape? So he didn't just take off? As a possibility. So Jesus realized his vulnerability. He also kept watch. You'll find three times where Jesus says to the disciples, keep watch, keep watch, watch and pray. To... It's no coincidence that the angel appeared to the shepherds in the picture here because they were diligently keeping watch over their flocks. Way past time everyone else had gone to sleep. God wants people to keep watch, to be alert, to, to realise what's going on. It doesn't say what Jesus is telling the disciples to keep watch over. It might have been over himself. But Jesus seemed to keep watch over himself when he was praying. He knew what was going on in his heart and his mind and he, so he stayed awake to pray because he was keeping watch over himself. He also had an eye on his adversaries. And he was the one in verse 42, even though he said to the disciples, keep, one, uh, keep watch, he was the one that said to his disciples, hey, the, the betrayer is here. He kept watch over the, what, the enemy's actions. I think it's Peter or is it James that warns us to be alert because our adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking one to, someone to devour. Is that like James 4-7 or something like that? He kept watch over his friends. He knew exactly what was going on with his disciples and wanted the best for them. But here's the thing. He kept watch upon his father. He was looking at what his father was doing and who his father was. Uh, late January we had a guest preacher and I was on holiday but actually here at the time and he quoted uh, a famous physician, geneticist, geneticist uh, the leader of the Human Genome Project named Francis Collins. I bought his book, actually ordered it during the sermon uh, and, and have been reading it through. So I did go on Google during the sermon. Um, the most important relationship, Francis Collins said in this book, is we are to develop, sorry, the most important relationship we are to develop on earth is a relationship with God. The most important relationship we are to develop on earth is a relationship with God. And so Jesus, when he's keeping watch, is looking to the Father for strength, even when temptation is bearing down on him. Jesus realized his vulnerability, he kept watch, and then Jesus prayed. I said before, he spent his last three hours of freedom in prayer. Why? Well, I think he liked it. But he realized it was vitally imperative for him to be able to stand in the face of temptation. He went back to God. He came back to the disciples. He went to God. He went back to the disciples. He went to God a third time. And he changed his words. He used these words, something like this. I know God can. I know God can. I know God can. Last night I was 
uh, sitting beside Laura and I pulled a book that I haven't been reading for a while and I pulled it off the, the shelf beside the bed and, and read it through and up came this quote from this famous Methodist minister. His picture's on the screen now, Ch uh, Samuel Chadwick. Uh, and he said these words. Can you see it? Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. I don't know how serious you take sin. And I don't know how serious you take prayer. But Jesus, to avoid falling into the trap, decided to pray. He decided to pray. And it wasn't his first time, was it? He's developed a lifetime of praying. So we should too develop a lifetime of prayer. So when troubles come, we'll be well equipped. I don't know how much you've prayed before. Maybe you've never done it. Maybe it confuses you or it's hard to get your head around. I just encourage you that prayer is a conversation. It's just a conversation. Address the one you're speaking to. Jesus, most of the time, well, every time he prayed, addressed the Father. Most prayers in the Bible are addressed to the Father in the New Testament when they understood Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Occasionally, they were to Jesus. But address who you're talking to. Address who you're talking to. Um, compliment and thank them. It's a conversation. You, you compliment, you thank, you share your burdens, and you declare your willingness to obey because you're addressing God. It's just a conversation. Have a try. The, the three times pictures is, is quite phenomenal. He was, where was Jesus at the time? He was just outside Jerusalem city in a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane actually means, if you look it up, means oil press. Uh, in the oil press, they press their olives three times. Can we go back to that picture or forward to that picture? I don't know which way it is. Yeah, there we go. So there we go. We, they're in the oil press and you put all your olives uh, down in that oil press and then you get the donkey attached and you roll that stone, uh, that heavy, heavy stone over the olives to press the oil out. You do that two times. Each time you add weights on the bar and it makes it heavier and so it crushes more and more olive oil out. Or yeah, uh, And each press, it's less and less quality. But there's an interesting thing. Satan denied Jesus three times. Jesus prayed three times. He's going through that press again and again and again. And I believe they waited. The Father made them wait until Jesus had sorted that out. Three times he went back to him, an hour each time. Father, take this away if possible. You can do it. Yet not what I will, but you what you will. Incredible. Well, let's just sum up. Jesus prayed. Jesus kept watch. Jesus realized his weaknesses. That's it. Just remember Jesus prayed. If you can change your life in prayer and go to God, it'll be phenomenal. I just want to pick up because we talked about the disciples. I want to show you a little bit about God here. God is phenomenal. Verse 28, right at the start, he, it said, you will, or, uh, verse 27, sorry, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Failure is no object to being part of God's family. I know that every single person in this room has failed. It's no object to being part of God's family. It appears that Jesus knew that Peter would fail him even before he pulled him out of the boat and said, come follow me. Jesus knew all of his disciples would des desert him before he picked them out. But Jesus says, hey, do you know what? You're going to fall away, but I want you to actually come into Galilee where you're going to serve me. I want to close the words with uh, one of my favorite commentators. He's written some thoughts on this passage, and I just want to share them with you. They'll be on the screen. His name's Charles Swindoll. Uh, I don't remember a time when he wasn't Bible teaching or writing books.
Today I invite you to leave the memories of your past failures with the only one who can neutralise their poisonous effects. I challenge you to entrust your failings to the one who died so you might really live. I encourage you to trust in his forgiveness and turn from your past to consider the future God has for you. Rise from your shame, guilt and sorrow and ask, how may I serve you, Lord, with the rest of my life? He will, fear and forg- he will hear and forgive. What grace. I want to give you an opportunity to, to pray this morning. If you want to pray with someone, just in this front row where Eli is at the moment in the chairs, there'll be people up here uh, that would love to pray with you. And I'd invite you to come up just after the service and sit there until someone comes to pray with you. But I'm just going to give you a moment now to pray to Jesus, to pray to the Father and say, Father, I want to realise my weaknesses and acknowledge them before you. I want to pray before you now and I want to keep alert to what's going on around me and what's going on with you. I'll give you a moment and then I'll conclude in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, you're so amazing and, and so good and displayed in the life of your son, Jesus Christ. You're incredible. The grace and mercy that you display, like Laura talked about, the joy that you want to bring to our lives as we overcome sin and the ways of doing that, Father, is just incredible. So we thank you so much. I do pray for this church that we would be more of a praying community. For those who are with us just for this one day only, that you'd help them to take away to pray. And that we'll spend many hours of joy in your presence because we're talking with you, communing with you, learning from you and growing in you. Father, help us to pray. We Teach us to pray, we say. In your holy name, amen. Well, thank you so much. It's been a joy to be with you this morning. And thank you so much for coming along today. A uh, cup of tea and coffee like Malcolm said next door. And uh, yeah, otherwise, have a great day. Thank you.